Tomorrow, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will drop out of the presidential race and might endorse Trump. And we don't know what the deal is and which bribe Trump offered him. But I'm expecting that Trump has agreed to name RFK Secretary of Bears. Just to mess this up further, the website The Hill reports that RFK's endorsement of Trump is being held up because... His wife, Cheryl Hines, from Curb Your Enthusiasm, does not want him to endorse Trump. No, I didn't email Larry and ask him what he knows. Regardless, none of it may make any difference because there is some stunning new pro-Harris polling and equally stunning new reasons for me to repeat my question from yesterday. Is Trump dying or something? Kennedy first. He says, I will not confirm or deny that he's dropping out and endorsing Trump, but he has confirmed that tomorrow he will address the nation about the path forward for his campaign, which as three quarters of his support has vanished, the path is pretty much narrowed to taking his campaign, stuffing it in the backseat of his car, and then dumping it in Central Park and trying to make it look like it was killed by a bicyclist. Yeah, a bicyclist named Joe Biden. ABC News reports Kennedy will drop out. The Washington Post merely intimates he has had multiple conversations about it with Trump, including one in person. The campaign insists nothing is final. He'll be announcing whatever he announces in Phoenix at noon local time, and Trump will be at a rally in Glendale, Arizona at four local time. And yeah, you do the math. This really is Trump's only obvious remaining play at this point, and it is debatable if it is as big a deal as it would have been literally just five weeks ago. To start with, it is unclear how many Kennedy voters there are left. And of course, all the polls asked a backwards version of the question that would answer that. NBC quizzed Republicans and Democrats about Kennedy in July, before the president dropped out, and found that Kennedy's approval among Republicans was plus 11, while among Democrats it was minus 38. That, of course, is exactly the opposite of the information we could use, which is what do would-be Kennedy voters think of Kamala Harris and Trump? What do they think of Democrats and Republicans? Before the Biden dropout, when it was 45-43 Trump in the head-to-head matchup, when they would expand to the full field with all the other psychos like Kennedy and Cornell West and Jill Stein, Trump would lose 13% of his support. What's more, though in state after state it's clear Kennedy is now hurting Trump, the most recent national poll by Ipsos says Kennedy has been taking 2% of Trump's support but 3% of Harris's support. The Times poll in just the battlegrounds produces an even foggier number. Kennedy has been taking 3% of Harris's support and 3% of Trump's support. And all of this is still predicated on an assumption that the remaining Kennedy voters will vote for Trump or Harris. I mean, if you were dumb enough to be ready to vote for Kennedy, you are dumb enough to vote for Jill Stein. There also continue to be early signs, and I mean like predicting next month's weather early signs, that we might have to change that last sentence there to, if you were dumb enough to vote for Trump. Obviously, the Tim Walls speech went well last night, and the Obamas will continue to piss off the fascists right through the election. And please, dear God, get Kamala Harris on stage no later than 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. I'm pleading with you. This is not a sporting event. The ratings do not go up the later you stay on past 11 o'clock. But more intriguing than all that, these new polls, something very, very odd has come out of Rasmussen polling, a dyed-in-the-wool, pick fights on social media, in the tank, boot-licking bunch of conservatives, founded by the guy who created ESPN, then was removed from controlling it two months before it signed on, and eventually he got like 740 grand for his share of the whole company. The average Rasmussen poll shaves four to five points off the Democrat in every other poll. And yet in Wisconsin, Rasmussen now has Senator Baldwin beating Eric Hovde, 
the guy from the brawny paper towel wrappers, by 10 points, and it has Harris beating Trump by one point. If that poll in Wisconsin by Rasmussen is accurate, the weather may be getting very dark for Trump very fast. And then the University of New Hampshire has put out polling on Maine. On July 25th, the week Biden dropped out, this same poll had the pretty damned conservative Republican secure Maine second district at Trump plus two or Trump plus four with Kennedy and the rest in the mix. The same poll now has Harris up by five in both measures, a seven or nine point swing to Harris in a conservative bastion in less than one month. And in the same poll, she is ahead by 28 points in the liberal first district of Maine and 17 overall in the state. It is startling. Or if you prefer, stunning. That is the word politico of all outfits as used to describe interior numbers in major polls, the cross tabs as the kids call them, Taking time out from listing who went to the Politico grill at the Democratic convention, their analysts delved into 10 quality polls, and they now write, quote, Harris has registered gains across a wide range of demographic categories, but the improvement has been especially pronounced among young voters, non-white voters, and women voters. Taken together, the numbers suggest that the Harris swap has largely repaired a fraying Democratic coalition, has repaired the party's image presidentially among independents, and has dragged the election back to a toss-up at the minimum. In short, she has managed to do something that every candidate can only dream of, appeal to her base without turning off swing voters. Politico cites these gains in particular, 12% improvement over Joe Biden among black voters, 6% among Hispanics, 5% growth among non-college educated, seven points added among women, 9% among independents, 17% among young voters. Politico started that report with the word startling and ended its analysis of the eye-popping gains with a different word, and that word was unprecedented. Here's another word to use about what's going on. Crazy, as in crazy gains for Kamala Harris because Trump is crazy. I don't know if this is truly the most Freudian slip Trump has ever made or the most Freudian slip Trump could ever make, but it sure feels like it. And it sure feels like it contains an admission or a plea for help or a foreshadowing or something. It is now many hours since I first heard it, and I am still shocked by it. And I'll stop with the preamble already. But Trump has gone on the Hugh Hewitt gullible hour and was, for whatever reason, unable to complete his hoary old anti-Semitic trope about Jewish Americans voting for Democrats. If Jewish people vote for her, and I use this expression, they ought to go out because Kamala is, is a person... He left out the second half. The Trump trope is if Jewish people vote for her, they ought to go out and get their heads examined. He left out and gets their heads examined. This brain damaged, deteriorating, crazy individual who packs more personality disorders per pound than anybody else in human history. This man who has over the last several months showed accelerating signs of physical decline, whole body decline. He said... If Jewish people vote for her, they ought to go out. And he forgot the rest of it. He forgot to say and get their heads examined, which by no coincidence whatsoever is what he should be doing right now, getting his head examined. Just to sell the point further, the interviewer, well, the, the stenographer, Hugh Hewitt, the Lars Larson of Eric Erickson's, followed up with a promotional tweet in which he gave it all away. Trump remains the best interview in America, has been since 2015, because he tells you exactly what you think. 
You bet your ass, Sonny. Hugh Hewitt deleted that post. Again, it sounds like a badly written scene in a badly written episode of Succession. And I know that's redundant, but that's a different story for a different podcast. But it also sounds like one of those moments when everybody who doesn't recognize its importance looks back and says, and that's when I knew Trump was finished psychologically. One more time on this. If Jewish people vote for her, and I use this expression, they ought to go out because Kamala is, is a person. Oh, Dr. Freud, if that is insufficient, <laughs> everybody forgets things like the, the second half of their hateful catchphrases, the half that could be applied to themselves. Everybody does that, right? Trump also got back on the outdoor stump yesterday, and he announced that American generals are woke and fake, and he claims we have F-32 fighters, even though there is no such thing as an F-32 fighter. And he made up a story, made up a story, that Kamala Harris met with Vladimir Putin just before he invaded further into Ukraine in 2022. Utter bullshit. They have never met. Harris went to the Munich Security Conference in February 2022, warning Russia and warning that Russia was going to create a false pretext for invasion. Putin was not there. The closest thing Harris and Putin have ever come to a meeting is Harris talked about Putin once. This sounds nuts. Obviously, in a way it is, but in a different way, it's far darker between the polls and the escalating tone of absurdity in Trump's attacks on Harris, there is reason to suppose Trump and his very evil, not quite geniuses, may be shifting from bothering to even try to win at the ballot box to simply ginning up the rage and the doubt and the lunacy and the conspiracy so much that it, as they say, creates consent for him and his cooperative minions in the state legislatures and the House of Representatives to steal the election after they lose it. Thomas Edsel's column on Trump's next coup in the New York Times ends with a quote from Yale historian Timothy Snyder. I am thanking Edsel and quoting Snyder. Trump is in the classic dictatorial position. He needs to die in bed holding all executive power to stay out of prison. This means that he will do whatever he can to gain power, and once in power, will do all that he can to never let it go. This is a basic incentive structure which underlies everything else. It is entirely inconsistent with democracy. So thanks to the Times for that, and damn the Times for this. From fact check reporter Linda Q, take it from an actual billionaire, Trump is rich in only one thing, stupidity. A quote attributed to Governor J.B. Pritzker of Illinois at the Democratic National Convention. And the fact check reporter in the Times writes, this lacks evidence. While Mr. Trump's exact net worth is unknown, Forbes and Bloomberg estimate that he is currently a billionaire. Obviously, we know the New York Times has no sense of humor. I mean, Maureen Dowd is considered a humorist at the New York Times. But does a hyperbolic joke now require a Times fact check so that the Times can claim it is being fair to Trump? I mean, if I ask how many times fact checkers and idiotic editors does it take to screw in a light bulb, is the Times going to fact check that and note that there is no empirical evidence that more or fewer of them would be required than of any other demographic group? Judd Legum has an amazing piece at Popular Information headlined, The Fact Checking Industrial Complex. Just one paragraph of that, please. The fact checking industry got that right, has attempted to prove its objectivity by producing similar pieces for the Democratic and Republican National Conventions. This requires some sleight of hand. Glenn Kessler's fact check in the Washington Post on the night Trump spoke to the RNC was limited exclusively to Trump. 
other noted fabulists on the agenda, including Tucker Carlson, Franklin Graham, Alina Haba, and Eric Trump, were ignored. Kessler's fact check of Biden's speech to the DNC included all other speakers on Monday evening. If you doubt that the Post is doing this, still doing this, oh, you want fact checks of Trump, do you, liberals? We'll give you some fact checks. Let me read you this from Amy Gardner, National Reporter, Washington Post. Quote, Donald Trump says he will refuse to accept the election results if he loses again, Biden said. But that's not true, Amy Gardner writes. Trump just hasn't said that he would accept, and he has previously said the only way he loses is if the Democrats cheat. Well done, Amy Gardner. If you manage to snatch fascism from the jaws of democracy with shit like this, please do so confident that when we are then all in the Trump re-education camps, there will be a sign hanging from just your cell door reading noted that Trump never said he would refuse to accept the election result, only that he didn't say he would accept the election result. So remember, give her two bowls of water a day. Also of interest here, did Hulk Hogan make a threat of violence against the vice president of the United States? Shouldn't the FBI or the Secret Service be asking this question and not some idiot with a podcast? Also, if Hulk Hogan did try to fight her, wouldn't she kick his fat ass? That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. us on this edition of countdown out of nowhere my lunch guest the other day who is not in broadcasting and never has been said he knew the former president of msnbc rick kaplan rick kaplan who once threatened to kill me live while we were both on msnbc or we were in the background we weren't the like the main show god knows that would have gotten much better ratings than anything they have now But we were live, and he threatened to kill me and was swearing at me live on MSNBC. So my friend at lunch and I, we traded Rick Kaplan stories. Mine still wins because he tried to kill me. Coming up in Things I Promise Not to Tell. First, there are still more new idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze... Worse, the Live Casino in Philadelphia. It, wait, I'm sorry. Apparently, that's is it's it's the Live Casino in Philadelphia. It has an exclamation point. So it's either Live or Live. Apparently, it's Live. Makes more sense that way, doesn't it? In any event, they put up a big sign outside greeting Bruce Springsteen as he comes to Philadelphia for a bunch of tour dates there at the ballpark. Per Springsteen fan tour organizer Stan Goldstein took a picture of the sign at the Live or Live Casino in Philadelphia and captioned it, you had one job and it's a picture apparently of Bruce Springsteen, Live Casino Hotel in the corner and it says, welcome to Philadelphia, Bruce Springsteen, S-P-R-I-N-G-S-T-E-I-N. So it could read, Welcome to Philadelphia, Bruce Springsteen. They misspelled Springsteen's name. They misspelled Springsteen's name. Kid from the Jersey Shore, and they misspelled his name in Philadelphia. You had one job. Also, it's it's just me, but the photo of Springsteen? Looks like Jerry Seinfeld. Are we sure that's Springsteen? Maybe it's some guy named Springstein, and he's going to perform at the Live Casino. Maybe Bruce in 1977, but it's much more Seinfeld, and the look on his face is, is that my car on fire in the parking lot? Disaster all around. Springsteen spelled wrong. 
The runner-up, worser, Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani, along with Mike Lindell, co-hosting Steve Bannon's streaming show on Nazi TV or whatever they call it. Real Nazi's Choice. I forget what the name of it is. The War Room. As if Steve Bannon could fit through the doorway of the War Room. And the one argument for letting Steve Bannon out of prison and perhaps letting him out early is so that Rudy Giuliani and Mike Lindell would not be hosting the show in his absence. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. And by the way, wasn't Mike Lindell supposed to go undercover at the Democratic National Committee by shaving off his mustache? Because in the video, he's wearing a mustache. It's possible he has a collection of them at home in a jar, hopefully his own. He's been indicted on shaving other men's mustaches and keeping them. In any event, uh, just a little update from Rudy, who says Steve Bannon is being prevented from watching television or streaming stuff or listening to radio or listening to his own show. And, oh, by the way, Steve Bannon is being tortured in jail. Steve Bannon, uh, let me tell you this, Steve Bannon is not being treated the way other prisoners are being treated. His case has been moved from the Bureau of Prisons to crooked Attorney General Garland's office, and they're calling the shots because contacts that I have in the Bureau of Prisons have told me they've been taken out of the case. So he's being, let's say, tortured. No. And uh, he'll, he'll be out. I'm sure he'll be able to talk all about it. Right. But, boy, this election is about a fascist regime. And well, Steve Bannon saying- is prime number one. Uh, now, Rudy is right about this election being about a fascist regime, just not in the way he's saying. I was going to say thinking, but Rudy doesn't think, does he? And, by the way, he also used the little gerbil, the little bunny rabbit air quotes around the word tortured. So who knows what he actually means? But But he theorizes Steve Bannon is being tortured at the instructions of Merrick Garland in a federal prison. I wish, but your winner, the worst, Hulk Hogan, who you will recall was one of the speakers who introduced Trump on the climax night, if that's the right word for it, of the Republican National Convention. Somebody who represents Hulk Hogan does much of what has destroyed our culture, not wrestling, wrestling's fine, Lots of fictional things are fine, but the belief in the culture of wrestling, the belief that it's anything but a performance, the belief that it's legit in some way, the belief that it's dignified in some way, it's an act, and it's a crappy act. It's like the guy who announces his name is Bruce Springsteen and comes out and sings Born to Run in the wrong key. In any event, here's Hulk Hogan on his threat against the Vice President of the United States. You want to get crazy? You want me to throw more beers out? You want me to body slam somebody? You want me to body slam Kamala Harris? I said you want me to body slam Kamala Harris? You want me to drop the leg on Kamala? Is Kamala a chameleon? Is she Indian? Okay, I like it. First off, yes, you heard him go, how? And he thinks Indian means Native American. I mean, not even Trump is stupid enough to think that the Indian in Indian African in the heritage of the vice president of the United States is Native American. That's how stupid this man Hogan is. Secondly, broadly interpreted, asking a bunch of people, do you want me to body slam Kamala Harris? could be deemed a threat against the vice president of the United States. So, circling back to Rudy Giuliani's friend Merrick Garland, prosecute him. Put him in prison. Let's see how far he's willing to take this t-shirt ripping wrestling bullshit culture. I know, I know. Don't say things like that. How about this? Put him in one of those Steve Bannon jails and he can be tortured by being forced to listen to Rudy doing the Steve Bannon show. Hulk... By the way, you're 71 years old, 300 pounds, drunk, and desperately out of shape. I would avoid the vice president. She'd probably beat the crap out of you, Hogan. Today's worst person in the world!
finally, our number one story in the countdown, things I promised not to tell, and back to my favorite topic, me. How exactly was I supposed to tell the police that the man threatening to kill me was the president of MSNBC? He was chasing me through the studios. He was too overweight to run. But even though he inexplicably lied and said he was six foot seven, at six foot five, this guy, his name was Rick Kaplan, and he was the soon to be ex president of MSNBC, just as he was already the ex president of CNN, he still had strides as long as my own. Plus, on that night of August 8th, 2005, I was multitasking. I was trying to mentally record everything he was shouting while also drawing him away from the live microphones of the live studio in which he had started shouting while also fishing for my office key so I could lock myself in there if need be while also figuring out how I would hit him if it came to that while also trying to register the superb double takes from my colleagues past whom he was stomping like an out of shape Frankenstein while also trying to suppress an overwhelming and seemingly inappropriate desire to burst into laughter while still game planning the soon to be inevitable call to the cops of beautiful downtown Secaucus, New Jersey. Uh, hi, yeah, yeah, he's, he's trying to kill me, my, my boss, the, the president of MSNBC. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the cable television network. Yeah, yeah, exact. Down the street from the London Fog Outlet store. Yep. Yeah. One MSNBC Plaza. I know it's a dumb address. Uh, he's about 60, uh, 275, 280 pounds. By the way, he says he's six foot seven, but he's only six foot five. Why? Why does he lie about his height or why is he trying to kill? Uh, right. Well, I did a commentary urging the viewers to stop smoking and he's afraid of the mention of blood. Hello? Hello? As all of this played out in my head, President Kaplan was huffing and puffing his way through our giant studio, weaving through the news assignment area, past the makeup room, down the hallways nearing the offices of my show Countdown, and past the bank of a couple of hundred television monitors with a different face on every one of them, each seemingly staring slack-jawed at the executive screaming threats at the only guy on his own network who got any ratings. I'll pay you back. <laughs> I'll get you. I'll finish you. I'll kill you. This had all begun roughly 10 days earlier, in late July 2005. An oral surgeon who had intended to examine a growth on the roof of my mouth had instead, with one pale look, silently betrayed his suspicion that it was cancerous, and he cut the whole thing out. I was on my way to work anyway, it was too late to get a replacement, and I was bleeding so much that our technical director and I decided to pre-record all of my on-camera segments for that night's show, thus reducing the chances of viewers hearing me say, President Bush today, while blood oozed out of my mouth, over my teeth and lips, and onto the desk, like I was Dracula anchor. When... The following Wednesday, I got the unexpected all clear from the surgeon's office. I decided to devote some of each night's newscast to a campaign to help viewers and myself quit smoking. My premise was a simple one that I had never heard argued before and have rarely heard argued since, that it would be a lot easier to quit if you didn't have cancer than if you did have cancer. I pitched my producers on the series. I went into Rick Kaplan's office to get his seal of approval. He was enthusiastic and supportive, and most rare of all, he was paying attention. And then I said I was also going to point out that if you got the good outcome like I had, they would merely stick a laser in your mouth and you'd smell your own flesh burning for like 48 hours, and you'd have to keep spitting out your own blood. Don't say that! He can't suddenly threw his meaty hands out towards me in a strangling gesture and then just as quickly clamped them over his own ears and closed his eyes and began actually screaming, no, 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 no. I thought he had gone crazy. As it proved, he was just practicing for going crazy later. I'm sorry, I'm squeamish. I get the point. I, I just can't handle references to, you know, uh, the, the red stuff. Go ahead with the series. Just just tone down the, uh, the red stuff. I toned down the red stuff 
And my executive producer, Izzy Povich, sent him the scripts, and he told her to tone down the red stuff a little more, and I went and I did that too. We all decided to start the anti-smoking series the following Monday, August 8th, 2005, by nauseating coincidence, that was the day after the ABC anchorman Peter Jennings had died of lung cancer. The MSNBC president had been a producer on Jennings' newscast. I had long since written and recorded Jennings' obituary, and now the somewhat cold but still journalistically valid segue would have to be made. We would have to go directly from the 12-minute-long Jennings obit to the start of our anti-tobacco campaign. Eight or nine minutes into that pre-recorded Jennings obituary, Rick Kaplan came out of his office and walked the 50 feet or so through the vast open newsroom to where my anchor desk was. His eyes were full of tears. This is wonderful, he said quietly. Peter would have liked this. He gave me a thumbs up. Then he walked to a second desk another 50 feet away where his first big hire, a woman named Rita Cosby, was about to premiere his first big gamble, her new show, immediately following mine. I was actually moved by Rick Kaplan's comment. I did not once think of phoning the Secaucus police. But then I began the anti-smoking segment, and as I focused on the camera and the teleprompter in front of me and detailed the blood and the gore and the spitting and how that was the good outcome, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this weird sight. The president again left his office and waddled out along the wall 30 feet ahead of me in the general direction of the control rooms. Within moments, as I continued to read my script, he was back in the studio and standing right next to my camera, gesticulating wildly. I said, they never say it, but wouldn't it be really easier to quit smoking when you didn't have cancer than when you did? And Kaplan responded with the same two-handed choking gesture he had made briefly in his office much earlier. I presumed there was some simple problem, like that the building was on fire, but I calculated that I could still make it to the show's scheduled finish time, 8.59.59 EDT, and still survive even if others perished. That's countdown for this, the 830th day since the declaration of mission accomplished in Iraq. I'm Keith Olbermann. Good night and good luck. You son of a... Rick Kaplan suddenly screamed. From the other anchor desk, I could hear, and this is my impression of her, Good evening, I'm Rita Cosby. This is Rita Cosby, live and direct with Rita Cosby. And I'm Rita Cosby. She was not a big woman, but she had a voice on her like the horn on the Staten Island Ferry, if it had a cold. You are over the top. You are disgusting. My first thought was that Kaplan had forgotten that microphones 50 feet away were live during the premiere of his pet project. Shh, Rita is on. I actually whispered to him, silly me. I don't give a half if Rita is on. You were told by Izzy Povich that the piece was over the top and you needed to cut it, and you didn't. I still couldn't bring myself to yell back we're in a live studio. I did cut it, and Izzy read it and approved it, and she said you had too. And, and, and Rita's premiere is going on over there in that sort of direction. Maybe you should yell at me closer to the assignment desk, maybe? I don't give a crap. If Izzy approved it, then she's an ass. And I can't trust her. I can't trust you. You're all idiots. I can't believe you did this to me. I'm trying to get Rita's show off the ground, and you start talking about spitting blood into a garbage can. Well, now I was getting angry. I couldn't resist. Yes, Rita is, in fact, live and direct from that desk right over there. And if you'll notice, she keeps looking over here at us, wondering why you are yelling during the first minutes of her first show. So why don't we move over here, Rick? I began to move away from him. And we're walking away from the live mics. And, and we're walking. And we're walking. And Rick and Keith are walking because the noise isn't really professional. Well, we're not talking professionals, are we? We're talking idiots. We were walking, and he was still screaming. You're idiots. I will never trust you again. He had begun to trot or stumble or whatever he was doing. This is not over. I will pay you back, self-serving garbage. I will get you, and I'll get that a-hole Izzy for not staying here and reading that script. How many times did you intend to say spit blood into a garbage can before I stopped you? I now realized what he thought had happened as he had gestured spasmodically at me while he stood next to my camera. I briefly let my focus shift to amazement at the fact that this guy who had been in TV news for 25 years knew almost nothing about how TV worked. 
I explained to him that Izzy and one of her assistants and I had gone over the script several times and taken out half of the gorier references. Then they suck at television! And since I can't trust anybody here, since they won't stand up to you and edit the script since you obviously bullied them... He balled up his fist and stomped his foot on the floor as he called me a bully. I'm now going to have to approve every piece of your copy! By this point, I was backing into the countdown work area with its array of desks and all the producers Kaplan had just insulted. I knew one of them would dial the phone when I said, Call the cops and call this lunatic's boss. Did you hear me? And if you don't like it and you don't want to come into work tomorrow, that's fine too. I never did get that part. But now I had him. I crossed my arms in front of my chest slowly, like you have seen every news anchor do in every television news promo ever shown in the history of the world. I flashed as evil a slow-mo smile as I could. Oh, I'll be here tomorrow. And then I made a sweeping gesture back towards my staff, who were both, of course, literally and figuratively behind me. And so will all of them. Suddenly, at that point, for no apparent reason, Rick Kaplan's hysterics were replaced by mere confusion. He even stopped huffing. At almost normal volume, he asked me, All of who? Only at this point did I turn around to discover that my entire staff had already left the building. There was nobody there behind me. Of course there was nobody there. Izzy Povich told me later. He went into the control room and threatened all of them first. So we got on the phone back to the office to tell everybody to get the hell out of the building. She paused and laughed. I mean, we love you, but we're not crazy. Rick Kaplan's exorcism was a brief one. He began screaming again. I'm going to end your career tomorrow. I'm going to completely F you up. He turned and stumbled away from my office. Good luck sleeping tonight. I slept like a stone, and not because Kaplan had previously threatened to fire me for not leaving my father's bedside after what they thought was a heart attack to fly to L.A. to appear on The Tonight Show, and not because he'd once threatened to fire me because he didn't like my tie, and not because he had previously threatened to fire me for not doing something during live coverage that I had already done, but he thought we hadn't done because he was watching us not live but on delay on his DVR president of a network and I slept beautifully not because I correctly guessed this would be it for Rick Kaplan and it was the next day human resources forced him to apologize to me and 10 months later his bosses fired him nor did I snooze blessedly because of any bravery or stoicism or fatalism on my part but I slept well simply because of the realization that even after all of this Rick Kaplan was still only the second or third craziest MSNBC executive I had ever worked for. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Please share this podcast with somebody who does not listen. And my apologies yesterday... I was going to blame the fact that there was no podcast at midnight, as there usually is, and the first actual listing on Apple Podcasts was at about 8.30 or so in the morning yesterday. I was going to blame that on technical problems, but in fact, I simply screwed up. You know when they say, check the boxes? I didn't check the right boxes. The thing didn't get published. I apologize. I may need some time off. Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, the musical directors of Countdown. Maybe I can suspend myself to get a day off. Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, the musical directors of Countdown, arranged, it wouldn't be the first time, arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by the best baseball stadium organist ever, Nancy Faust. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Other music arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. My announcer today was my friend Stevie Van Zant, and everything else, as usual, was pretty much my fault. So that's countdown for this, the 76th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,323rd day since convicted felon Donald J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. 
Use the September 18th sentencing hearing if it happens. Use the mental health system. You've got this, President Biden. Use presidential immunity. The Supreme Court says you can do whatever you want as long as it's official to stop him from doing it again while we still can. And anti-Semitic, anti-immigration, gun nut Republicans, please stop shooting at Trump. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news requires. Till the next one, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Thank you.